tons of tech news today, CPUs, GPUs, all of that, but I wanna start out with this because I was really hoping that the B650 motherboards for AMD's new platform would come at more aggressive pricing. AMD themselves had said that there should be $125 boards available because the overall platform cost for Zen 5 is just, well, really expensive. Sorry, did I say Zen 5? Sorry, AM5 platform overall uh, is just really expensive. The MSI motherboard lineup has leaked along with its pricing, and I'm seeing several outlets reporting that they can confirm this pricing. So to be clear, this is ah, just a leaked screenshot, um, but like I said, uh, I, I've read this article on, on a few different sites and some of those sites said that they've confirmed with their sources that this should be accurate. So apologies if it ends up not being, but what I'm looking at here is the majority of the B650 boards are over $200 and the cheapest one, the Pro A series from, uh, from MSI is at $189. Now, why is that so relevant? Why is this so bad? Well, take a look at this. If you went with an AM4 platform build, ah, you could go with a uh, Ryzen 5 5600, which honestly, in most games, when you're GPU limited, you're not gonna see much actual performance difference here between if you bought the more expensive new platform. And then if you go with the matching MSI uh, board from the previous generation, I mean, I guess this one doesn't have Wi-Fi, that's $95. So this equivalent board from the previous generation is almost $100 less, or like half the price of what we're seeing uh, it coming out for now. And then the memory cost for the platform as well is significantly lower. If you just wanted to throw in 16 gigabytes of 3200CL16 memory, it's $45. Now, if we compare that to this new platform cost with the cheapest B550 board we've seen listed from MSI, and again, it's pretty much the equivalent board from the newer platform. That's coming in at $190. The CPU itself, if we go with the 7600X, is coming in at $299. It doesn't come with a stock cooler anymore, so you'd have to at least buy a cheap cooler. I, I threw in one that's under $50 here. I mean, you could go even lower than that if you wanted to. And then I'm throwing in the absolute cheapest 16 gigabytes of DDR5 memory I could find listed on PC Part Picker, but that's still $70. And that brings an absolute like bare bones budget, if, that, if you can call it that, 7600X platform cost to $606. So in other words, it's a increase of $300 or a doubling of the cost here. By the way, I could have even thrown in cheaper compatible motherboards. I'm just throwing in the equivalent uh, uh, a, a Pro series board um, from AMD, uh, sorry, sorry, from MSI, just without the Wi-Fi. Now, why is that so significant? You're like, yeah, you know, it's just $300, what, whatever, uh, in the cost of the total build. Well, in the cost of the total build, that's the issue because Sure, if your budget is high enough to where you can get this new platform and the best graphics cards, fine, great. I think high-end builds, this can still make a whole lot of sense. But the problem is that if you're looking at graphics cards prices right now, let's say, um, <laughs> how should I put this? You could throw in an RTX 3060 almost for free when you're comparing these platform costs, <laughs> when we're looking at the difference. Not quite, but, but what I really wanna look at is like, look at the price difference between going with the cheapest RTX 3060 at $370 versus an RTX 3080, which come in at a little over $700. So what I'm saying here is the price difference between getting started on these two platforms, the older platform versus the newer platform, you could fit the difference between buying like an RTX 3050 or 3060 compared to fitting in an RTX 3080, which overall in most situations, at least if we're talking, you know, single player type games, you're going to be GPU limited. And when you're GPU limited, the performance upgrade from the RTX like 3060 up to an RTX 3080 is almost doubling the performance in GPU limited situations, which is absolutely crazy. Even if you were entirely CPU limited, comparing the 5600 to the 7600X would gain you 
you know, 15 to 30% performance at the absolute best. And like I said, in many, many gaming situations, you're not even CPU limited and you will see literally no better performance between the two. So that's my main issue right now. If you guys are looking for value, I just don't think this new platform is it. And I think value and oriented builds should still be focusing on the older platform. The main, I guess, advantage you might see from this uh, newer generation here is the, you know, I guess, upgradability to future platforms and things like that. But honestly, at a $300 pricing difference between these uh, getting started, you could wait, you know, a couple generations ahead and just buy a new cheap motherboard <laughs> and CPU for that kind of pricing difference. I'm always an advocate for buy the best performing system you can right now. Uh, because in the future, I think when you're thinking about future proofing your build, um, the amount you might be paying to do that now compared to how, it, how much it'll actually pay off in the long run, I don't always think makes a lot of sense. There is that kind of a happy medium here, but I think right now, unless you can afford to put a, you know, already get like a 3080 or better class GPU along with your 7600X build, I think it makes more sense to spend less on the platform cost and increase your GPU. Anyway, let's get into some other news stories today. We're seeing a Ryzen 7 5800X 3D powered laptop coming from XMG. Now, this is just a press release, so we're not seeing it reviewed or anything like that, but it looks like we are seeing a notebook. Um, it's a desktop replacement laptop, so, you know, portable-ish, you know, <laughs> like, take it for what it is. Um, but it is a 5800X 3D powered laptop, which is insanity. So, you know, I'm not too into the laptop space, but you know, just kind of interesting to see something along those lines. And I've got to say that this is kind of the other issue, just, I mean, not the notebook specifically, but the 5800X 3D is kind of a bit of a spoiler for the 7000 series gaming performance anyway, because like I said, you it, it, you know, that that's compatible with a much cheaper overall platform cost um, and has very similar gaming performance to the new generation, although I am interested in the X3D chips on the newer generation. Hey, anyway, we should be getting full reviews of the 4090 very soon, but there are starting to be a leaked benchmarks come out as people do test these, because currently the only official numbers we have are the ones published by NVIDIA themselves. Most of what they want to give us seems to be, you know, using DLSS and things like that. And they, they want to advertise that two times to four times the performance of the 3090 Ti. Um, well, we are seeing a leaked CUDA performance benchmark. So to be clear, this is not a real world game. This is synthetic, but it's showing a 60% improvement over the RTX 3090 Ti. And if you dig into the details of NVIDIA's graphs they've published, it seems like a 60% actual rasterized performance gain over the, the 3090 Ti does sound more reasonable based on the actual hardware that we're seeing. And then if, so if you're not using that new frame generation or ray tracing features, um, you know, that's more of the performance gain that you might expect over the current, uh, the current flagship. Now, this is Geekbench 5's CUDA testing that we're seeing here. So you can, uh, WCCF Tech article has it kind of listed against the 3090 Ti with a score around 260,000 and the 4090 with a score over 424,000. So anyway, it is a big performance jump, don't get me wrong. Um, but I'm just saying it's, it's not the 2X to 4X performance that NVIDIA wants to use in their marketing slides. Uh, speaking of NVIDIA GPUs, NVIDIA is shutting down all GPU operations and their main office in Russia. Uh, the statement they released is the decision to, uh, to shut down the office, which employed some 300 people in Russia before the conflict between Moscow and Kiev broke out in late February was made due to the inability to ensure effective work from its employees. While the ranks have dwindled since then, the company still employs some 240 people in Russia, the NVIDIA representative told the magazine, adding that the decision was announced to employees back on September 30th. NVIDIA is now actively taking uh, out on charter planes those who agree to relocate to offices in other countries, according to the source. The relocation scheme, however, has not been officially confirmed, and apparently this is um, via the Forbes outlet. So... Anyway, I uh, thought I'd throw that in there in the GPU news. Now, speaking of GPU news, we have some AMD RDNA 3 news, although 
I would love to be giving you performance numbers and all of that, but instead it looks like it's GPU PCI IDs revealed. Um, so at, at with showing at least eight SKUs for the next gen Radeon RX and Radeon Pro series. And basically it's coming from some tweets from Rogaine, uh, Rogaine, sorry. <laughs> Uh, giving us some uh, actual Navi 33 IDs. Now, I don't know, guys. I don't want to dwell on this story. It, it doesn't seem that mind-blowing to me. I really want some performance and especially pricing numbers from RDNA 3. Um, I'm really hoping we see some aggressive pricing competition. Also very curious um, where their ray tracing performance ends up. That kind of a thing. We'll see. Anyway... Uh, Intel Arc A770 and A750 GPUs, again, reviews should be out soon. But until then, once again, we are seeing some leaked scores. These ones are from Geekbench again, this time in the OpenCL and Vulkan benchmarks. And once again, this is only so useful because it's a synthetic benchmark. Um, but we are seeing, eh, let me get myself out of the way here. Um, we're seeing the, the A750 scoring um, below the 6700 XT, and we're seeing the A770 a little bit above it in the Vulkan API, a little bit below it in OpenCL, and um, it's pretty closely matched, but a little bit below the RTX 3060 in Vulkan, and, and a little bit above it in OpenCL. Um, anyway, we are expecting, like I said, the A770s uh, to be, you know, pretty competitive with the 3060 in modern games, but on the older APIs, uh, you got something left to be desired. And be careful if you don't have resizable bar support on your system, because that's basically a system requirement to use the GPU. Do not even consider getting one without resizable bar support on your platform. Now, speaking of the Intel Arc GPUs, Intel is open to the usability of Arc gaming GPUs in data centers and servers. Um, so basically, uh, Intel was being interviewed with Serv Server the Home, and at the event, he says, I also confirmed a key detail. Intel is not going to limit its desktop cards to desktop only. Unlike NVIDIA's CUDA license, the company said it was not planning to prohibit their use in servers. Uh, this is a welcome announcement. Now, so basically, NVIDIA likes to um, have more restrictions between what, what can be used as a server, a data center type uh, GPU, and what can't. AMD has been a bit more open with that, and it looks like Intel is going the more open route. This makes sense because as they're just trying to break into the GPU space, I think they you know, are obviously going to try to take any market share that they can in any segment. So uh, makes sense to me that they would be doing that. Now, Samsung is targeting mass production of 1.4 nanometer process technology by 2027. Uh, this is uh, their press release, and I think we're also seeing two nanometer process technology targeted by 2025. So it'll be interesting to see what kinds of devices and, and, and things we see on those smaller, uh, smaller nanometer sizes. Now, Asus um, is talking about improved um, you know, cable management for builds, things like that, covering them up. Seems like this is a trend on a lot of the newer motherboards and, and, and case designs and things, is trying to get a little bit more, uh, you know, covered look to a lot of the cables and things. I, I think it's nice to have those options. Now, in other news, we're seeing a, another game updated with XCSS, but also getting FSR 2.1. Uh, native quality, which is interesting here. So the games we're talking about here is Judgment, and this is taken from a Steam community uh, post they had about patch 1.02, so I haven't had a chance to actually test this out yet, but uh, FSR 2.1 native quality is interesting because this is basically the uh, uh, AMD equivalent of NVIDIA's DLAA, where, you, where with DLSS, usually you're running the game at a lower render resolution and then it upscales it. Um, to improve performance. But if you run at the native resolution, you could still replace the game's temporal anti-aliasing with the uh, you know DLSS version of the anti-aliasing effect, which can be better than some games' um, you know default TAA. Well, FSR 2.1 also has a very strong TAA implementation. So running it at the native quality again, you actually lose a little bit of performance usually. Same thing with DAA, DLAA. But in a game that you're not having any trouble running, but maybe doesn't have the best anti-aliasing, um, this can be interesting, and it's nice to see AMD's version getting out there into some games live. And again, more support for Intel's XCSS, 
which is always nice to see. Now we're seeing PlayStation Studios head teasing new PC and games as a service investments, uh, possible transmedia collaboration with From Software. So um, there's uh, a lot of quotes here. So they're saying in terms of future M&A activity, the answer to that is we are not at all finished with our strategy of trying to grow PlayStation Studios inorganically. So that's talking about getting more investment from uh, other potential uh, and also looking into um, other potential targets that fit with their strategy to the extent that potential targets allow us to accelerate the way in which we are able to deliver our strategy. We'll certainly consider further M&A activity uh, to add to our business portfolio. Um, they were talking about you should think of collaborations on the game development side first and foremost, but it's also not unthinkable with our PlayStation Productions efforts that we explore opportunities. They've recently um, bought stakes in from software and things like that. Now, what I would love to see, like uh, this article from WCCF Tech is quoting, and all my link, uh, descri uh, links will be in the description to my sources, would be, I would love to see Bloodborne on PC. I would love to get a nice remaster and see it on PC. That would be amazing. We're seeing a lot of Sony exclusives coming to PC. Can we please get Bloodborne? Okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, I'm seeing an article here. This seems to be leaked out or something. I'm not sure if these are official, but it looks like if you're a World of War fly, uh, World of War flight, geez, World of Warcraft player, uh, the Dragonflight PC requirements have been reported to uh, have the minimum requirements significantly increased compared to previous expansions, with the uh, minimum memory requirements doubled in SSD required, not re recommended, and DX12 capable GPU as mandatory. Um, so interesting to take a look at that if you are a World of Warcraft player, but the, well, I'm seeing this from WCCF Tech, their source seems to be coming from another website, and I just see the screenshot rather than a link to where exactly they're getting this from, so I don't know. <laughs> anyway, just throwing that out there. Um, now, Halo is reportedly dropping their slip space engine in favor of Unreal Engine for some future projects. This is really interesting because the slip space engine, I believe, had been touted as, uh, you know, this was their one going forward, should make development easier, but then apparently they did have a lot of development trouble with this engine, with Halo Infinite and all of that. So the point is, um, it's looking like we could see yet another major franchise dropping their in-house engine and switching over to Unreal. At this point, I really hope that Unreal Engine 5 is actually good. Because <laughs> Unreal Engine 4 on PC games had some issues. We saw a lot of asset loading stutters and things like that. So it's shaping up to be like, Unreal Engine 5 performance is probably gonna be what shapes uh, GPUs moving forward in, in terms of which one you really want. So, so being really well optimized in Unreal Engine 5 seems like it's gonna be a really big deal moving forward. Now, this isn't really a PC news exactly, but it applies to a lot of YouTube channels. So like on my channel, a lot of times I'll do 4K graphics comparisons and things like that. Well, um, YouTube Premium might become the only way to stream 4K content. I would hate that if that's the case. This is apparently a feature that's being tested on a small scale, similar to how they increased the number of ads they ran on videos. Uh, Google likes to test out features, like they'll deploy it to you know some small percentage of users and see how they react. So it's looking like some users were reporting that uh, scre uh, streaming in 4K quality was listed as a premium feature for them. I'm hoping that this is just something they're testing and that it doesn't actually get followed up on and implemented because I would hate for my 4K comparison stuff to be locked behind a YouTube paywall. Uh, that sounds pretty terrible. Anyway, um, uh, other channel news, um, I think the Over Overwatch 2 comes out today, right? Are you guys interested in seeing that on the GTX 1060? Maybe see how it runs on an old GPU, something like that. Uh, anyway, I might test that out if I have time. And if you guys heard um, uh, children's cartoons in the background, I don't know if you can hear it or not, but my, my daughter's homesick with me today and she's she's watching some cartoons nearby. So if you did hear that, you're like, am I crazy? Are there cartoons going on? It was probably in the background. Anyway, I hope all of you have an excellent day.